Ah, <laughs> Eric's there. And what a surprise, you're on a Zoom. Yes, I'm virtually in Chicago. Wow, it does look like you're right in Chicago. Where are you hiding? Are you at our G2 office? Yeah, <laughs> I want to be. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for being here via Zoom, the godfather, founder, CEO of Zoom. Very incredible company. And I've also been fortunate as a fellow entrepreneur to get to know Eric a bit over the last few years and watch him build an incredible company. We do share an investor in Emergence Capital. And uh, so it's been fun. And I have gotten a chance to even meet him live. He does not only exist in the virtual world. I visited him in San Jose at his office. And I've always had a lot of fun talking to him and also really learning from him, very much an entrepreneur I admire. And not only for his incredible success, she mentioned, Lauren mentioned the incredible IPO, but I think you also, I've always enjoyed, I think you just do business the right way, very authentically. And we have a great group here, Eric, in Chicago, and they're all very eager to hear and learn from you, as am I. And so I do have a few questions prepared, but we're also gonna do a Slido. And those of you that are here with Meredith, go to Slido, slido.com. The code for the Eric session is Zoom. Slido, go to Zoom and please submit your questions. And so Eric, in addition, I'll ask a few questions, then we'll get a lot of audience questions. And uh, with that, we'll get going. But please go to Slido, go to Zoom, submit your questions, upvote your questions, and I will ask Eric your most popular questions. And hopefully Eric will get some fun, fun surprises for you. But my questions will be less surprising. But I think one of the most amazing things, I know your mantra in life and for your company is delivering happiness. And Lauren mentioned you're number one on Glassdoor, so I'm jealous. So I want to learn from you. How do you deliver happiness to your employees? I think the first of all, you know, to deliver happiness is our company culture. So on the one, just myself, I asked for the question, what kind of a company I want to work for the next 10 to 20 years? I want to be happy. That's why this is our company culture. However, how to make sure Delivering happiness to our employees, to all the employees, that's really hard. That's not easy. You got to start, you know, hiring the right people who can fit very well to our company culture. After join our company, and we do all we can to care about them in terms of their career development, development opportunity, in terms of communication. Make sure they understand their career paths. Make sure you know we pay them very well. I think we do everything we can. Like we. We wanted to them to learn, right? And they can reimburse the books, no matter they buy for themselves or for their family. They always re reimburse the books. There's no cap. Mm -hmm. One thing we are trying to do is make sure every employee, when they wake up every morning, ask her the first question, do they feel happy or not? Mm -hmm. If they do, please come to the office mm -hmm. as quickly like as possible. If you do not feel happy, take a step back. Mm -hmm. Try to understand what's the root cause. You can stay at home. We still pay you. No need to come to the office, figure out why you do not feel happy, and come up with a solution. Hmm. Wow, that's amazing. So really what you're saying, Eric, is reflecting every morning. And do you do that yourself? Do you wake up every morning and ask yourself, are you happy? That's the first question I ask for myself every morning. Is the answer ever no? Yes, yeah, sometimes, uh, seriously. And occasionally, oh, I did not feel happy. I did you know, spend several hours at home trying to figure out why, because mm. sometimes maybe family related, may not be business related, and you also need to figure out a solution. So. Mm. Oh, that's wonderful. And I am also working on, we call conscious leadership. So I have a leadership coach, but I think a lot of it is meditating, reflecting, and uh, but I think that's a good, good practice. I think I'm gonna start asking myself every day if I feel happy. And I think the more important thing is not, if the answer is no, don't just grind on. I think what you're saying is actually reflect think about why, and then change something, right? Yeah, makes sense. I went uh, uh, one step further compared to most of our employees. So in the evening, I, have, I, I did a cover out like a 15 minutes of time in my calendar. I asked the same question, do I feel happy or not? If I start over today, what, what I should do differently? Mm. In the morning, in the evening, I asked for this question twice. Mm. So you reflect in the morning, you ask yourself, are you happy, you ask in the evening. And I am curious, just one example, when's the last time the answer for yourself was no, and what did you learn from it? What did you change as a result? I think that's uh, uh, several, actually two months back, right? So, cause, uh, you know, happened to be one of the security issues and uh, reported by the, the security researchers, right? 
And uh, I was not happy because, you know, support we should have done differently. And I was not happy. I stayed at home, tried to figure out why is that, why we were not paranoid enough. Mm-hmm. Why don't we talk with the, the security researcher earlier, right? And, again, you know, it took me several hours and until I really understand what had happened, make sure the similar thing not happen again, and then I went into office. Wow. No, and I remember reading about that in the news. Now you are very high profile. And uh, we also had a security issue, but luckily no one cared. No, just kidding. We did care, but it didn't make it all over the media. In your case, it did. But after those five or six hours specifically, was there something you changed with your company to make sure it doesn't happen again? Or what, I'm just curious, what was the specific action that you took? There are two, yeah, there are two specific actions. You know, first of all, we got to be proactive on everything, especially, you know, being a public company. I think at the CEO, you used to be at a private company. Everybody think about girls, girls, girls. Mm-hmm. But being a public now, I think the number one thing I should think of as a CEO is about risk factors, mm-hmm. right? I think that's the number one change, at least from a CEO perspective. I need to make a change. I did not do a good job. That's the first thing. The second thing is make sure our security team proactively work together with those security researchers about what they are going to publish or report. And quite often we think of this is this is the issue they, they are going to report. Maybe, you know, in their report, maybe a different problem. We need to be very, very specific about those problems. So we learned those two lessons. First one is for me. The second thing is about our company. Mm. And that is interesting because you said as a private company, it's growth, growth, growth. And I have VC investors and that's all they and I want. But I think you're right. Once you're public, I imagine you also have more to lose, right? There's more risk. There's more people counting on you. And so it sounds like you've had to shift your consciousness. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the one thing I learned after we became a public company. Mm. I love that. And it sounds like you're teaching your employees to basically do the same thing you do. Be very reflective, thoughtful. And then every day you get better. And that ultimately, I think you're then pursuing, my story is you're pursuing your true divine purpose. And then you're feeling happier. You're right on. Ultimately, your business cannot grow to the next level unless all of the employees can grow to the next level, can become a better version of their of their selves, you know, myself included. If all of us can become better every day, every year, I think, uh, you know, the company will do well. Mm. Yeah, and it's truly now people are calling it growth mindset, but it sounds like you epitomize that and you try to also inspire that, teach that to your whole team. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I think, and we're working on doing the same, and, uh, but I got to work harder so my glass door rating gets as good as yours. <laughs> and in addition to making your employees very happy, and I suspect they're related, but I know also on G2, you have, I just looked, you have 11,885 customer reviews, which I think is one of the most, and not only the most, but it's overall a 4.5 star rating. And they are very authentic. And I think that really proves, and you actually have the highest satisfaction score by far on our G2 platform for video conferencing and the categories you're in. So also your customers. And we are also a happy Zoom customer. And uh, one funny related story. I remember when I visited Eric in one time in San Jose at his office, I said, hey, Eric, I love Zoom. But one thing I'm missing, whenever we walk in our conference rooms, it takes forever to start the damn meeting. Right, and like, what's the phone number? How do I start this? How do I dial in? And he's like, oh, I have a solution. It's called a Zoom room. And Eric, you'll also be pleased to know now we have many Zoom rooms. And so thank now you. I can just walk in and hit a button. So you made yeah. me happy with that. So thank you for that. But how do you do that for you know, 11,000? Yeah, I know you have many more. I think I saw you have 700,000 customers now. But how do you bring that same concept of delivering happiness to your customers? Yeah, so I think the brand, you know, he, he made a very, very good comment. I really like what he said. Trust is everything, right? Mm-hmm. Especially when we build a solution, the goal is to make sure they have happiness with the customers to win the trust. It's very important because we started from SMB customers, now have so many large interest customers. We need to keep everything open and transparent, I meaning in, in terms of a feature release, in terms of what had happened, you know, why we have a service problem or why we have a, a high availability. We want to keep treat our, quite often treat our customers as our extended, extended family member of our company. Mm. You know, that's a really important. Now, another thing is to make sure when we make a decision, quite often when you are making a decision internally, you always look at, you know, we always look at it from an internal perspective, right? Like engineers, hey, you do not need to, to write this part of a code or you can save money. But all those are not right. 
you got to make a decision from a customer perspective. What will customer get? What's the benefit we are going to give to customers? If we change our company philosophy, every time we make a decision, always ask this question, will this decision help our customers not? Will this decision deliver happiness to our customer not? That's a key to win customer, to build a trust. Mm. So it sounds like your philosophy is very much get everyone to always have the customer in mind. And you're talking about code optimization. I know a lot of our engineers, they want to make their code cleaner, better, more beautiful. But you're saying that really doesn't matter if it doesn't make the customer happy and you're, you're teaching your whole team to think that way. But then, so it sounds like it's a philosophy, but how do you take that down one level? How do you get customer feedback? How do you know they're happy? How do you know they're unhappy? How do you get the feedback? And then how do you act upon it? Very easy. We have we, we recommend every employee go to the G2 Club, right, to look at the customer feedback. The good reviews and negative feedback, we need to understand specifically spend more time on those negative reviews. Mm. Why this customer, they do not feel happy. Right? And then take a step back to understand the root cause, either the feature problem, or maybe sometime they, they called us, we did not respond to our customer in a timely manner. So we share all those great stories. Also, we share all those like, uh, you know, negative feedbacks as well with all of our employees. In, in our all has meeting, we also share those in stories, you know, in front of all the employees. Wow. We make sure every employee understand every day they need to think about the customers. Mm. So you really, and that's wonderful to hear, but you're saying that the G2 reviews, they do help you. It's real-time feedback. And I remember this also when I visited you and I was somewhat surprised. I think Eric said he actually likes the negative part of the reviews. You know, because we ask everyone reviewing Zoom, we ask them, what do you love? But we also ask them, hey, what do you dislike? What could get better? And what is about, amazing about Eric, I think it's the same growth mindset, right? He actually says, well, I learn more from what they dislike. And I think, and I know also, I think at the beginning, you were an engineer, you were coding it yourself. You're still an engineer, but now you have a lot of other things to worry about. But I think you also said, hey, a lot of times you see something a customer dislikes and you just write some code and you fix it, right? Do you still do that? You, you, absolutely, you are right on. That's why you you might already Im implemented that feature. I want to have a feature like, hey, I go to the Cheat Crowd uh, Zoom website. I only want to see the negative negative reviews, or maybe get a notification. Whenever I get a negative negative review, I got a, a, a personal the email notification. Right, that's even much better. Probably you already have that feature. Yeah, that's you know, I, I needed that feature. So that's a great feature. So we'll email all of you only your negative comments. That is how you can build your own Zoom. But I do think that's the way we learn. And actually, I, I think and I, I aspire to be the same way, you know, but I, I do think you learn more about, yeah, how the company can get better, how you can get better when you also see where you're not delivering happiness yet. That's a wonderful mindset. But one other cool story I read about you, Eric, apparently the weekend after IPO, your IPO, you were on Twitter and somebody submitted, so you're not only using G2, I love that you are, but I think you're also listening on Twitter. But I heard a story, read a story that, Someone had a complaint on Twitter about Zoom, and I heard you jumped into the thread, and this is the weekend after your incredible IPO. Is that, is that a true story? That's a true story, because I spent a lot of time on those social, social media website and try to understand why customers they do not like us, right? And our goal is to deliver happiness to customers. We do all we can, all we can to try that. However, some customers, they are not happy for sure something you know, already went wrong. That's why, as a CEO, I need to spend time on that. Like back to, you know, the feature request, right? You know, I think after this uh, fireside chat, probably, you know, call your VP of engineer team. Let them make a hard commitment, right? It's we got to care about customers. So uh, that's very important, yeah. Yeah, so you've certainly kept that mindset. And I think I also read another quote about you right after your IPO that said, I think your reaction was like somebody in the financial media is like, oh, wow, Eric, this must be amazing. You must feel incredible. And this evaluation is so high. I think I, what I read was you just said, oh, this means it's time to go back to work. Is that also true? It's very true. Because, yeah. you know, stock price is out of our control, right? The only thing we can control is, uh, is about execution, right? And, uh, you know, we got to go back to work. And the whole team, you know, we celebrated, I think, a Thursday. And Friday morning, we all flew back to, to San Jose to start working on Friday afternoon. So, and, uh, you know, so we should not pay attention to stock price. Yeah. I did see you actually went to New York, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. But why before didn't you, that, why I, didn't you zoom in? No, I did use Zoom okay. zoom in for the IP router show. But unfortunately, Zoom does not have a feature to let you virtually ring the bell. Ooh. So we need to add that feature. Ooh. I want to be your pilot customer for that feature. 
Can you ship it in about, I need about two years. No, one year. I think it will one go year? up. Okay, we'll see. Maybe after no. your talk today, we can get there in a year. But I, no yeah, way. if you make that feature ready, maybe I could be the first one to do that. That would be really fun someday. That's, cool. That's a dream. But, um, and uh, so that is just you know, incredible what you've done with the, the customers, the satisfaction. And now I did want to open up our Slido, Eric, to see what the audience here would like to know. Yeah, by the way, I really like a Slido. This is great tools. Yeah, do you use it for your all hands? Yeah, not for our internal all hands, but all for all the uh, customer face meetings or partner meetings. Yeah. Now, we also use it for our all hands. You should try that. And yep, I do, it's the only idea. weird thing, sometimes you get some weird questions that get voted up. Yeah. Oh, so, by the way, so we let our employee submit the questions anonymously mm. before the all hands meeting. Okay. And, uh, but we do have some questions here, and Slido can be anonymous or not. But one, the first, the most upvoted question from John Rougeau is, uh, how do you get to Zoom to stand out so well from the competition? And I, I really have the same question, because certainly when you started Zoom, a lot of investors thought you were crazy. So obviously you'd built WebEx at Cisco, but there's a lot of competitors, right? I remember back in the day, GoToMeeting, right? We've all used these tools for years. It seems like a very crowded space. So A, how did you decide to enter that market and then B, how do you stand out in such a crowded space? Yeah, John, that's a great question. So that's a, one of the reasons why after I left Cisco in 2011, when I tried to raise money, there's no VC who wanted to invest in me. Because mm. the market was so crowded, they don't believe anyone can put it off to build a new solution. However, I did spend time on talking with, talking with many customers. I asked about the, the question, hey, which solution are you using today? Do you like it? All those people I talked with, none of them told me that they liked the solution they were using at that time. Mm. So I know actually there's a market opportunity. If I, if I can build something better than all the solutions out there, I think I have a chance to survive. And that's the reason why I dared to start a company. Mm. I think in terms of how to you know, compete against the others, you know, legacy players like WebEx, like uh, GoToMeeting, I think it's three things. Number one, start from company culture. That's really, really important. Deliver happiness, care about the customers, do all we can to make a customer happy. That's the number one thing. Number two is just the you know day-to-day -day, you know execution. You know, a lot of small things got to do work so hard. If our competitor CEO, they work eight hours a day, I need to work 10 hours. Mm -hmm. If they do not sleep, I do not sleep either, right? It's hard work, the second thing. The third one is about stay humble. When you make a progress, very likely, you know, you might become arrogant. When customer, they, they report an issue on Friday, don't wait. You got to work on a solution over the weekend, you know, deliver happiness to them on Monday morning. Otherwise, you lose the trust. Mm. So the culture, hard work, and be humble, don't be arrogant. I think that's our formula. Wow. Now, and I think um, I always I sense about you, you really live that, and... And I think what is also amazing, yeah, you seem like the same guy. Even when we first met, you were not so famous yet. But I think I can sense, you know, you're the same authentic human being and, and still bringing that passion and that culture. It is very, uh, very inspirational. Absolutely. I still cannot afford flying there. It's too expensive. I uh, better yeah. save the money so to yeah. use Zoom. <laughs> nice. Do you give yourself a discount on the Zoom calls? <laughs> No, I pay more, actually. Really? <laughs> um, now, that was a really interesting question and answer. And uh, one more question from the crowd. Um, let's see. We have a lot of interesting questions here. I'm just trying to pick a good one, Eric. Ooh, this is a good one. I mean, you've already delivered so many cool features, but what's the feature you most want to add to Zoom and why? even if it's something ridiculous? The number one feature I wanted to add, still not there yet, say, I want to shake hands with you now. I cannot. So no matter how good our Zoom video conference experience is, I cannot give you a hug or cannot shake hands with you, right? You cannot feel like that. That's the number tries. one feature I'm, we wanted to have. Yeah, I can shake hands with Virtual you. Virtual hug? Walk you, walk you hug, you can feel like that. In the future, in 10 years, we might have that feature. Mm. So you want to bring the human feeling, the human experience. 
And you're right, that's why we still all came here to Chicago, it's to connect as humans. And you're right, it's not quite the same yet on Zoom. Yep. Although what I find, that's why we love doing these events, we get to know all of you in person. And then once we have that relationship, then from there we can work very effectively by Zoom. And, yep. uh, but, but I think you're right, if you could bring that virtual sense, that would be wonderful because then we could all be with our families more, right? And uh, yeah. wouldn't get on airplanes less. So I love, I love your vision there. Yeah. N not only that, in the future, see, like uh, if I'm using Zoom, I, I'm eating pasta, you also can smell that too. I think all those features will be added in, so. Yeah. Oh, this is an interesting follow-up question. Do you ask if you're happy in the morning before or after coffee? Uh, I, unfortunately, I do not drink coffee. Otherwise, I cannot sleep. And uh, I, I, I drink a tea occasionally, tea. but most times just water and sometimes tea. Again, I say before I do anything, when I w wake up, the first thing. Reflection. Yeah. Yeah. So before coffee, because you don't drink coffee. Sometimes before anything. Tea, before yeah. anything. Before any the first thing you do every morning is to reflect. Uh, one other interesting question here. What's the biggest risk? This is from Curtis. And some of these are anonymous, some of them aren't. But thank you, Curtis. Curtis is asking, what's the biggest risk Zoom has taken as a business? And did it pay off? So Curtis, that's a good question. I think uh, we did not listen to uh, a lot of, uh, I would say, either VCs or some friends. They told me that, Eric, don't build another video conferencing. You will not get anywhere. You should think about something else. I think that's the biggest risk. Almost every friend of mine you know, told me that, don't do that. And the good news, I did not listen to, to them. So I think uh, I took that risk, yeah. Mm. And that does take a lot of courage because everyone, all these smart investors, all your friends are saying, Eric, maybe you want to start a company, but you're a great coder, code something else, right? Absolutely. And, yeah. and you still did it. That is, uh, that is true conviction. And uh, one more question from the crowd, which is interesting to me, from Brendan Hufford. What's the most effective way you've seen companies use Zoom? Like where maybe a customer is like, wow, I, you, know, you were even impressed. Like, it's a really effective, cool way to use Zoom. I think for, for the sales Ooh, I team. I love the new backdrop. You, you went to, where are you now? Exactly, so every today there's so many remote workers. You got to give them flexibility, give them modern tools like Zoom. You know, sales rep, they can work anywhere, any way they want, and talk with the customers. And quite often they use the customers in either the headquarter picture or campus as a virtual background. It's very effective. You know, immediately, you know, the meeting is uh, becoming you know, more intimate, yeah. right? And the customer like that a lot. Yeah. Now I feel like having a cocktail <laughs> with a straw. <laughs> Why is that? What beach are you on? Where are you? That's a really nice pool. <laughs> it's very true. That's yeah. a wooden background feature. But so you do see more of your customers using it. I don't think we are yet at G2. And I don't know where Ryan is, our CMO, but I think we should start doing that. It'd be fun to be able to drop in different backdrops. And, uh, and one other interesting follow-on question I have personally, because I also have a family, you have a family, but I think you've also used Zoom yourself to make your own life better, right? Like, how have you done that? Yeah, I, I only travel twice a year. I mean, business travels. You only travel twice a year? For business travels, at the most. Wow. Over the past five years, unfortunately, this year I broke that rule. I already traveled three times. Mm. With that, I can that see the IPO. Uh, you need that feature. <laughs> very true. Yeah. yeah. But so you only traveled twice a year, and now you've built a big global company. That's amazing. And I think you also have big teams. I know big engineering teams in China. And I also, like, I read somewhere, like, you only visit them every two or three years? Yeah, once every three years, the last time. And uh, yeah. But you, I assume you use Zoom. I mean, how do you stay connected to them? How do they stay connected to you? Yeah, with Zoom, we have employees in Denver, Santa Barbara, Atlanta, you know, Kansas City, in Europe, you know, China, Japan, Australia. We use Zoom every, every day. I think uh, with that, you know, I, I, except I cannot shake hands with them. I think I feel like we are in the same, you know, physical room. Yeah. Oh, that, is, that is amazing. I'm very jealous because I'm a 100K traveler on United. 
<laughs> so I think I have to start using Zoom better myself. I also jealous about your miles, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, and one, uh, let me see, looking for one more good question. And a lot of these themes have actually been addressed already, Eric, by, by a lot of your answers. But another interesting one, you know, how do you manage upwards to keep your board and fellow executives focused on people when some of them, or at least the question says, when all most of them care about is the numbers? How do you keep your investors and maybe some of your fellow executives you know, that seemingly just want good numbers from you, how do you keep them focused on people? I think that's very easy because it boils down to you as a founder, CEO, you pick up the board member, right? You pick up the uh, investors. Don't pick up those investors who really care about your business. You got to pick up someone who really care about you and your, 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 your people, right? That's really very important. And also I, I treat our board member as our employees and do not think they are, they are my bosses, right? I just treat them as our employees, keep everything open and transparent. Number is good, they like it. If number not good, they do not like it, we will share with them why and move on. So, and if it does not work, you know, you need to figure out a way in two or two to three years, you know, get some new board member. Mm -hmm. so. And I do know one of your board members, Santi, Santiago from Emergence, and I haven't worked with him directly, but he seems like he has been a very, also very good to work with for you, right? Or yeah, he's great. We see great partner. He never, you know, asked about the questions, you know, starting from numbers. First question he always asks about, hey, how do you people feel? How does your, how does your employee feel? I, and they always start from people. Yeah. Mm. So you've gotten your investors to also be aligned with your culture of delivering happiness and your executives. Now, that's amazing, Eric. And uh, thank you so much for sharing all these insights. And thank you all for your questions. I think we have time for one more question, Eric. And this is one, and I've, I've read a bit about your journey, and I think you also have a very interesting personal backstory. But I'd love you to maybe just share, how did you, how did you get to becoming a, an entrepreneur and even getting into, you know, coming to America? How did you get to the point of starting Zoom? Yeah, so that's why I'm back to San Francisco now. I, I live in Silicon Valley. I think, uh, you know, a lot of people who live here, I think they do not feel like that. If you travel around the world, you'll feel like that. Silicon Valley is a unique place. Mm. I do not call that a Silicon Valley. I call that a startup valley. You look at the innovation, I think a lot of innovation or economy are driven by startup ecosystems. I feel like uh, I, I live in Silicon Valley, if I do not join a startup company or start a startup company, I feel like uh, I better move to some other places. That's a, you know, also I cannot share with my kids. I, I work for a very big company. You know, I feel like my kids will say, hey, dad, you are not, uh, you know, <laughs> capable, right? To work for a startup companies. And also when I was in, at a college, I also know that in the future, I, I was dream, you know, dreaming of starting a company in the future. I think because uh, I live in Silicon Valley, maybe that really happened to me a lot. So, and if you want to change the world, the best way is to join or start a company. Otherwise, join a bigger company is really hard for you to change the world. At least it's very slow. Mm. So that's what drew you to coming to California, coming to Silicon Valley. But how did you first hear about it? I mean, how did you know that was a place the best place for you to build a company? Uh, you know, back to 1995, 1996, I, I lived in China. At that time, you know, internet is very popular here. Yahoo, Netscape, America Online. But here, you know, at that time back in China, it, internet is still very young. I thought it probably would take another 10 years to have internet. You know, I, I, I wanted to embrace the first wave of internet revolution. That's why I, I moved here, so. Excellent. Well, I'm glad, glad you did. And uh, thank you so much for joining us, Eric, and sharing how you deliver happiness to the world. Thank you, really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, I appreciate it, thank you. And hopefully I'll have a chance to come visit you in San Jose again and I can give you a real hug, but thank you. Anytime, thank you. Okay, take care. Thank you.